The last section, chapter 6, <clears throat> involves Gaussian integration, which is an alternative to using the Newton-Cotes integration rules that we've discussed previously in this chapter. Gaussian integration, sometimes referred to as Gaussian quadrature, is particularly useful when you're integrating uh, integrands of this particular form, where you have the function f of x, integrating with respect to dx, but multiplied by a weighting function, uh, we're referring to as w of x. So for our typical integration rule of, uh, of this form right here, uh, again, we choose the weights a sub i and the abscisses x sub i in a certain way. With Gaussian integration, it's done in a way so that the actual quadrature rule would be exact, I mean, no approximation now, I mean, exactly correct, if the, if the function was a polynomial of degree 2n plus 1 or less. Uh, when you have, and keep in mind, we have n plus 1 abscisses here. So in that particular case, this is what we would actually have. Instead of an approximation sign here, we actually have equal, that the integral of w of x times the function, which we're assuming now is a polynomial of degree to uh, less, up to, but not, uh, up to but not larger than 2n plus 1, would be equal to the summation of these weights and the abscisses evaluated at that polynomial. So this idea of constructing a rule that will be exact for very high order polynomials um, is a way of sort of getting at a little bit more higher accuracy than we would have had normally with just regular interpolation. So as indicated in the next slide, the question remains, how would you choose the weights, the a sub i's and the abscissas x sub i's, so that this equality does in fact, occur. Again, when the functions that we're integrating are of the form of a polynomial of degree 2n plus 1 or less. Well, one way to derive it is to take on certain formulations of what the polynomial could look like, the typical basis representations of polynomials. So for a scalar, we could represent, for example, the polynomial p0 of x, the first one being, say, 1, let p1 of x be x, let a third instance of a polynomial be p2 of x equals x squared, and so forth, up to the fact that you would get to p2n plus 1 of x, which is just the power x to the power 2n plus 1. So the power of x matches the index, basically. And then you could take each one of these representations here and represent it now in this formula. Right, so we're just actually going to pick the function to take on all these different forms independently. So we'll, in one case, if it was 1, another case, if it was x, another case, if it was x squared, clearly all of them are going to be polynomials less than or of degree less than or equal to 2n plus 1. And if you did that, then this would be the representation that you would have here. And what you would basically have is a linear system of equations. Because what you're saying is that, you know, you have constraints on both sides of what the integral should be, and you can represent what each of the summations uh, or would reflect, would be as you increase the power of x. So again, what we're doing is we're looking at a special case where now the polynomial, the function, the f of x, takes on a particular form which is just x to some power. And if we make certain choices of what wx can be, we can actually integrate what this, uh, this integrand would be and get a value, and that will be equal to the summation of a sub i times xi to the j's power for all those possible j's. And again, that represents a linear system of size 2n plus 1 by 2n plus 1. And we'll do this to the next slide so you'll see exactly how this works. So in fact, what we use is a linear system of equations to decide what the ai's and xi's are if we, in fact, are forcing equality for the function taking on these specific powers of x. So as indicated in the next slide, if let's suppose that the weighting function was e to the minus x 
and that we're integrating from 0 to infinity and we're going to choose n equals to 1. Okay, So we're, uh, in this case, we only have two abscisses. We're, if we're 0 indexing, n equals 1, again, would mean you'd have two abscisses. If n is equal to 2, you would have 3, assuming 0 indexing. All right. So in that case, what we would have is this rule then has to be exact. Uh, we want it to be you know, exact for certain number, uh, up to a certain number of powers of x. And what I've done is I've represented it up through uh, x to the third power. In the first equation here, we've assumed that the function is f of x is equal to 1. That's why you don't see anything there. Then we assume f of x is x. Then we assume f of x is x squared. And then we assume f of x is x cubed. And when we make those assumptions, then we will just evaluate the right-hand side. Well, if the function is just f of x equals 1, then f of x1 is 1, and f of x0 uh, uh, x is 1, and f of x1 is 1. So that's all we would get on the right-hand side. On the, left -hand si on, the, on the next equation, again, we're making the assumption here that f of x is equal to x. So when you plug in x0 into that, you get x0 back, multiplied by the weight function, and you get x1 back. And so you can see how we get the right-hand sides there. But you actually can integrate um, using the integration by parts. You can actually show what the uh, terms on the left are. The integral from 0 to infinity of e to, the e to the minus x is just 1. e to the minus x times x is 1. So these can be, the left-hand side can be done analytically in terms of and that's what you do. You pick an, a form that you know you can get the integral analytically. You don't need you know, a numerical approximation for it. And so therefore what we have is, in this case, uh, a nonlinear system of equations in the a's and the xi's. You don't know what a0 is. You don't know what uh, a1 is and x0 and x1. Now you may say, why is it nonlinear? Because you have equations here that involve powers of uh, the unknowns, which are the x0 and x1s, uh, you have powers beyond 1. So this is a nonlinear system. It has four equations and four unknowns. Don't be, don't be deceived to thinking there's only two, because again, we don't know what a0 is, we don't know what a1 is, we don't know what x0 is, and we don't know what x1 is. So we have four unknowns and four equations, but this is a nonlinear system. But we can solve it. And then when we do that, we will have generated a quadrature rule that is exact, in this case, when the weight function is e to the minus x, okay, integrating from 0 to infinity. So that's how it works. You can, as long as you can get an analytical representation over here, you can create quadrature rules you know, as, 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 as sophisticated as you want them to be. So as indicated in this next slide, um, we've gone ahead and solved that nonlinear system. You could use a newton raphson method if you wanted to, um, to derive it, but that's not the purpose. Of the, just uh, Right now, we're interested to know that should you solve that nonlinear system, what would the weights and abscissas look like? Well, here they are. This is what they would look like. They're messy. It's not as simple to describe them sometimes in terms of the weights and the abscissas as the newton coats, but they're pretty powerful in the fact that they're highly accurate and you only have to evaluate the function two times. So the integration rule that we just created is that if you want to approximate the integral of e to the minus x times any function f of x that walks in the door from zero to infinity, here is the quadrature rule. All you need to do is evaluate your function at this point and this point Notice that they're sort of like conjugates together, 2 minus square root of 2 and 2 plus square root of 2. And then you have to multiply times those two weights um, accordingly. So uh, that's a very simple lookup. It's easy, <clears throat> it's easy to code that. You simply write a function that defines what, the, what those weights and abscissas are, 
and you just write a very simple uh, single line cal calculation to generate an estimate of the integral. So you can see that this approach is very, very powerful. It's very cheap. Uh, it just takes more theory to develop the rule. But once you pay the price of developing it analytically, then you can reuse this over and over again. But again, it only applies for the context of what the weight is, the limits of integration, and how many um, nodes you want to be. So again, it depends on the weight, it depends on the limits of integration, and then how many abscisses are you willing to use. In this case, with n equals 1, we're willing to use 2. So this is a two-point Gaussian quadrature rule for integrals of that form. If you're interested in knowing, well, how do you represent the truncation error? The truncation error in Gaussian quadrature, um, again, would be a representation of taking the original definite integral and taking the difference between the rules. And again, the general form of any quadrature rule, not just Gaussian, is represented like this. Evaluating the function at some series of abscissas, taking a linear combination of them with weights. Well, it turns out that the error takes on this particular form here, a function of n. Again, n describes the number of abscissas you're using, how many functional evaluations you're going to take, multiplied in this case by, by a high, very high order derivative, f to the 2n plus 2 derivative some, at some internal point c. So again, c in this case is some internal point on somewhere between the limits of integration. Um, so this term depends on, you know, the, the number of points you take. Um, so, and it certainly depends on what the behavior of the derivative of your function is in terms of how large this error is going to be. So now we're just going to run through a couple of scenarios of Gaussian quadrature that were defined for particular um, weights and limits of integration. Um, and we'll start off with the Gauss-Legendre quadrature. So Gauss-Legendre uh, quadrature is a rule for integrating anything from minus 1 to 1. So that in this case, the weight function that goes in front of the function is just 1. And uh, the nodes turn out, or the abscissas or the nodes, whatever you want to call them, turn out to be symmetric about 0. So Whatever you get on the right side of zero, there'll be a corresponding one on the left, which will be negative. And um, the book has a table of weights and abscissas for all these rules. So in code, you would just simply create a table. It doesn't necessarily need to be a hash table, but just a simple table lookup of the weights and the abscissas. So again, implementing these are trivial. It's just you have to you know, derive them. They're kind of complicated nodes and, 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 and weights. But you just define a function with them and then simply look up the values, take the linear combination, and return a result. So if we go to the next slide, we'll actually see what, you know, what the tables look like. This is just, again, the rules have different numbers of weights and abscissas depending upon you know, what n is. And the lowest one is, is generally n equals 1, so you take two points. You, you want to evaluate the function twice within the interval. Um, if you're wondering, well, could you have a quadrature rule of just one point? You could, but its accuracy is going to be pretty limited. All right. so, um, so again, what we have here is that if you choose one node, these here are the abscissas, and the weights are just one. So uh, if you wanted to use the two-node rule for Gauss-Legendre, integrating from minus one to one, all you need to do is evaluate your function at 0.5773.5 and then also evaluate it at negative 5.7735. Because the weights are 1, you would just add those two functional evaluations and there's your estimate. It's that simple. The other rule is a little bit more complicated. Um, notice again that what, we, uh, what was mentioned earlier in terms of the um, structure of the... Uh, the nodes and the weights that uh, one of your nodes is going to be zero, so you're going to have to evaluate the function at zero and then multiply it by this value. Then you're going to have to evaluate it at this value and multiply it by this weight, and then there's the corresponding negative of it. Uh, so that's typical for these integrals involving, um, you know, when you're integrating from minus one to one, there's some symmetry around the origin. Uh, the weights are the same for those two. 
takes three functional evaluations. This is just so you can see the pattern again, that if you went to n equals 3, so you have four nodes, here they are, so these are the four nodes, and then here are the four weights. Um, they come in pairs like this, around 0, 0.33981, negative 0.33981, so forth. And their weights are the same, and then the other pair is here, and their weights are the same. So these would all be hard-coded in software. Again, no need to derive them. There's no need to do that linear system solution or nonlinear system solution to derive them anymore. You do that once analytically, and then there's your rule. A natural question comes up, especially with Gauss-Lagrange quadrature, is that what if your integral that you're you're, right, you're approximating doesn't have the same limits as the rule that you've generated? So again, keep in mind that what we just did in terms of looking at Gauss-Legendre says that here's my rule if I'm integrating from minus 1 to 1 and the weight function um, is 1. Um, so uh, you can't use that rule directly because you're not integrating from minus 1 to 1, but it's an easy adjustment to make is if you're willing to map your problem from the interval AB on to minus 1 to 1, then you can apply um, the Gauss-Legendre quadrature rule. What you have to do is make a transformation. You've got to change the problem integrating from AB to another problem integrating from minus 1 to 1. So it turns out that this is the transformation that has to be made that you have to be able to represent your original variable x as a function of the, of the let's say, the variable describing the quadrature rule. It'd be very confusing to have, to be using x's here and x's there. So that's why we've switched the variables there so that you can see the difference. So this is the transformation that you have to use to, to, to map your original integral into an integral of the form minus 1 to 1. Uh, it's just a simple linear mapping, b plus a over 2 plus b minus a divided by 2 is c. How do you know this works? Well, if you were to plug in minus 1, which is the bottom, it's the first, uh, it's the, the leftmost value you're integrating from, if you plugged in minus 1, you would see that what x would map to is a. And if you plugged in plus 1, uh, if you were to plug in plus 1 here, this would turn out to be b. You can do the algebra and show that. So, um, so this actually does the mapping that we need. As we move from a to b, you end up moving from minus 1 to 1 in c, which is exactly what we need with the quadrature rule. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see how the mapping works and how you would actually use your abscissa and weights from your Gauss-Legendre table for your more gentle, general integral form uh, A to B. So keep in mind, what we're looking at is our original problem is integrating, is approximating this derivative. I'm just kidding, derivative, this integral. So we've already decided, told, we've already mentioned that this is the linear transformation we need to make. Well, if you took differentials of both sides, if you took the derivative, you would have dx within b dc, that's the Greek letter c, times b minus a over 2, because, of course, this is a constant and the derivative would be 0. If we just did some substitution around, if we just did some, you know, divide both sides by b minus a over 2, what you'd really say is that, well, then what dc is in the quadrature rule is really 2 over b minus a times dx. So again, we've already checked the mapping. We know that when c is minus 1, uh, x maps to a. And we know that when c runs to plus 1, that maps to x is equal to b. So it matches up perfectly with our original problem. So this, therefore, is what we do uh, to approximate um, the original problem. What we need to do is take into account using a Gauss-Legendre rule on, on a different um, subinterval from minus 1 to 1. What we have to do is represent our problem uh, in terms of the integral from uh, minus 1 to 1. So here at the bottom what I've done is I've shown that we take 
the original problem as it stands and then make our substitution. We know that this integrating from AB is equivalent now to integrate from minus 1 to 1 with the change of variable. But dx has to be changed this way so that we know that the differential in x now is a scalar multiple of the differential in C. It's B minus A times 2, so that's why we have this term right here. And then if we pull that constant term out, what we're saying is that if you want to approximate this integral, all you have to do is take this scalar, B minus A over 2, the length of your subinterval, divide by 2, and then approximate this integral, which we can use a gauss legendre quadrature for. So that's why we've written it right here. Why, that's exactly why we have this term b minus a over 2 there. The weights will come from the table, because now we're just using the regular um, Gauss-Legendre quadrature. But you do have to be careful. You're not going to evaluate your function at the weights, again, that were um, in the table, because, again, you, you're making an adjustment now for the fact that you're on a different subinterval. So you have to evaluate the function at this particular value. You'll, you'll have to scale and then add. You'll have to do b plus a over 2 plus b minus a over 2 times each one of those values coming out of the table. All right. So um, so this is, this is a more general quadrature rule that uses Gauss-Legendre quadrature for any integral from a to b. But you just have to make sure all you have to do is calculate the new values to evaluate the function based on this linear transformation it will always be the same for minus 1 to 1. So for any time you want to use Gauss Legendre on something for a to b, all you got to do is take all those points out of the table, your abscisses, compute the corresponding xi's on a to b, plug in the function, weight them accordingly with the weights from the table, sum all that up, and make sure you finish out by multiplying b minus a over 2. And we're going to do an example to illustrate this, but this is just how you can take a Gauss-Legendre quadrature rule and make it more general. In terms of the error of using a Gauss-Legendre quadrature rule on that more general a to b of f of x dx, here's what it would look like, and it's quite complicated, um, but you're always going to see this very high order derivative there, uh, evaluated on the interior of your interval. And then you just have this other combinatoric type of expressions involving the length and some factorials. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we know that these rules are all perfect, or they're exact, up to polynomials of degree 2n plus 1. Now, think about what that means. Remember, we said if the function was actually a polynomial, pm of x, where m is less than or equal to 2n plus 1, then can you tell me what that derivative is going to be? In other words, what would the truncation error be if the function itself is a polynomial of degree 2n plus 1 or less? Well, it would be 0. Because again, think about it, when you have a scalar function you take the first derivative at 0. If you have a quadratic um, and you take, uh, excuse me, if you had a quadratic and you took uh, you took the first derivative, you get a scalar, you take the next derivative, you get 0. So that derivative is going to be 0, all right, which will take out any of the rest of the term. So you will get what you expected, that if the polynomial was of the, of the appropriate degree 2n plus 1 or less, there would be no error term. It would actually be exact. The rest of the lesson will just be just overviewing some of the other Gauss uh, quadrature rules that are derived based on different weight functions, the w of x, and different limits of integration. Um, and then in the next lecture, uh, I'll do some examples. Um, so this is called gauss chebyshev quadrature. Notice the weight function here has this particular form. Just to write it in a different way, that's 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So if you see that you need to approximate an integral with that in front of your function f of x, then this is the representation of the rule. Notice it involves pi. Um, the weights are all the same. 
uh, pi over n plus 1, and the, the abscissas can be described in terms of cosines. And the truncation error, again, has this particular form that we're going to see over and over again in terms of the derivative of the 2n plus 1 order, and then there'll just be some other type of representation of the scalar multiplied by that. So that's gauss chebyshev Notice, again, it integrates from minus 1 to 1 with that weight function. So all these depend on what the weight function is, so how they were derived. Here's what's called Gauss-Laguerre. The limits of integration are 0 to infinity, and the weight function is e to the minus x. So if you're integrating something that has e to the minus x in front of it, and the rest of it's some function of x, then you can apply this quadrature rule. The weights and abscissas are all in the book. It's on page 2 to, two to 3. So all of the weights and abscissas are in the book. And again, there's the truncation error for that particular rule. And this is what is called Gauss-Hermit. So it's a whole slew of different rules depending upon the limits of integration. This goes from negative infinity to infinity. Your weight function is e to the minus x squared. And, you know, its truncation error, again, has something times that second uh, 2n plus 2 derivative on the interior. And the weights and abscissas are also in the book, again, on round page 223, table 6.5. So again, just quickly going through these, but you would just basically look them up and see what, you know, what limits of integration you need to work with and the weights. There's another one called Gauss quadrature with logarithmic singularity. This is if you have ln of x in front of some function, f of x, and you're integrating from 0 to 1. And you'll just notice there is a slight difference because the summation will most likely be negative because of using logs, so you actually have a minus sign in front of the sigma, and its truncation error um, depends on how many nodes you're taking. In the case of two nodes here, n equal to 1, n equal to uh, 2 would be three nodes, and this is the case of just showing some examples of what the error is. And notice it gets better and better as you choose more n. So the kn term um, starts to shrink um, as, as you take more and more nodes, and usually that's the case. If you're willing to pay the price of more function evaluations, you could probably get a better representation of what the integral is going to be, but it's going to come at a cost. So we'll stop here. In the next lecture, we'll look at some Python implementations and do a few examples of Gaussian quadrature.